continuing on with our theme of the Hellenistic world and the spread of Hellenistic culture, I want to take a look at the Hellenistic philosophical schools. And I'm going to start by going back and again talking about some of the concerns of the era, some of the things that were sparking the popularity of the mystery cults who are also sparking an attraction to the philosophical schools. So let's take a look at the Hellenistic philosophy of the Cynics, the Skeptics, and the Stoics. I have a temptation to want to throw in the Epicureans because if you're going to talk about the big Hellenistic philosophical schools, you've got to include the Epicureans as well. But I know that I reserved that topic for some of the student presentation. So I'm going to stick to the Cynics, Skeptics, and Stoics, the most important of which are going to be the Stoics. So, there we go, advancing the slide, Hellenistic world, here's another map, you're probably getting so tired of maps of the Hellenistic world, but we're dealing with a multicultural society as it's emerging specifically in the urban centers, okay? The characteristic of the era, remember, are syncretism, a blending of ideas, cosmopolitanism, which is the idea of being a citizen of the world or a citizen of the cosmos. We identify that idea with kind of the citizenry of the large states like Alexandria, large states, large cities like Alexandria, right? You're not just a citizen of the polis, okay? The individual city-state as you would see in the earlier Greek era, but you're a citizen of the world. And that would make sense because you're now dealing with these large, large states that have really cosmopolitan designs, right? The expansion and, and conquest. Again, you've got the idea of universalism, which begins to spread, the idea of um, there being, you know, one great um, world order of, of sorts. I don't want to make it sound like some kind of the modern conceptions that we have. But you also have a rise in individualism, which would make sense now that you're part of a large, not necessarily oppressive, but large state that has swallowed up so many individual previous city-states, you as an individual participant at the level of politics, right, where you're part of a community, you're part of the polis, you know, as a voting citizen, um, that begins to decline in certain areas. And the sense of you as just one in a greater world uh, kind of being swallowed up in that, that mix probably gives rise to concerns for your individual goals, your um, sense of fulfillment on a personal level, since it's not going to be at a community level. And I don't want to overgeneralize, and I know I'm doing that because I don't want to make it sound like individual communities cease to exist. We already saw the Hellenistic religious traditions where people are joining these cults, becoming members for a sense of identity. But in these big kingdom states, you know, the traditional religion uh, is ultimately superseded by these growing cults of the ruler, right? Like the Ptolemies in Egypt. Um, I already talked about the divine kingship idea. You have to start to have cult situated again on a state level around these god kings, okay? There's no independent democratic political life for the most part. Um, you still do have some of that on the local level, but really having control of your destiny, that's gone. Really having control of you know the political um, destiny of your city-state, that's, that's really gone, right? There's a loss of autonomy. There's a feeling of isolation. This is the type of attitude or, or perspective that lends itself towards the birth of these new schools. The philosophical schools and the cults are a way people could seek freedom in their thought life, and in their worship, a sense of community, because again, philosophical schools themselves were communities. And the philosophical schools in particular appeal really to the educated class. I mean, that makes sense because when you join a philosophical school, you are going there for purposes of education, to grow in wisdom, hopefully. All right, so skepticism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, and the first one we'll deal with is cynicism. Like I said, I'm not really gonna cover Epicureanism, but those are the big four. As far as cultural centers go, I already looked at some of these in our interview or overview of the Hellenistic history. Alexandria, again, I'm going to show you these on the map as well. Um, you've got the Museum, the library founded by Ptolemy. It was a great research center. Uh, you both have literature and science, you know, ma mathematics, all kinds of things being pursued. It's a, it's a university for the most part. And you've got over 200,000 plus scrolls supposedly stored at this library at its heyday almost all of which are gone now because the library famously was burned, and there are different stories about when and how that was done. Antioch in the Seleucid territory, very important city. Pergamon, 
that independent little kingdom that eventually goes to Rome, this, uh, uh, the island of Rhodes, which specialized, I remember mentioning, in the era of rhetoric, and then, of course, Athens, which is where you have the Academy and the Lyceum of Plato and Aristotle, respectively. But then we're going to introduce some new schools. The Garden by Epicurus. We're not going to talk about Epicureanism, but Epicurus was one of the great uh, thinkers at the time of Alexander, right? He is uh, beginning his school slightly after the death of Alexander in Athens. It's known as the Garden. And the whole emphasis of Epicureanism, I guess I can sum up as a pursuit of pleasure, really the goal of happiness, but it's identified with the pursuit of pleasure. How that is understood, of course, should not be in the sense of sensation, um, uh, you know, drinking and sex and all the physical ideas of pleasure, but something in more in relation to the idea of an absence of pain. All right, so the idea of an Epicurean lifestyle was the idea of, in a way, shunning excess and avoiding um, sensation and just trying to live a life free of suffering. Okay, it was actually a very attractive school. Zeno of Kidium, who we'll look at in a little while, founds the Stoic school in a place called the Stoa in Athens as well, and that's founded a few years after Epicurus's garden. This is going to become the other big school of the Hellenistic era, the, 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 the Stoic school of philosophy. Um, these are all later dissolved, again, around the time of the middle 6th century at the order of the Emperor Justinian, who was, again, pushing kind of an anti-pagan program. And since these schools were founded by pagan philosophers, they were viewed as um, contrary to Christianity and ultimately closed down, kind of sadly, right? Uh, a lot of great stuff went on in the thinking of Plato and Aristotle and these guys. Anyway, let's start with the cynics, or the dogs, as they're known. The word cynic actually comes from the word dog. And this is a picture of the supposed founder of the Cynics, a guy by the name of Antisthenes, who is actually pre-Hellenistic, right? His date's probably around 446 to 366 BC. Some actually put him as a student of Socrates. He was an ascetic. He definitely doesn't adhere to the straightforward Socratic thinking or Platonic thought, but he was an ascetic who understood that virtue was sufficient for happiness. Okay, and he actually taught at Athens for the most part at a at a place called the uh, Kunosarges or the the um, White Dog. It was a temple to Heracles just outside the walls of Athens. Okay, gathered a follower, a group of followers that come to be known as the Cynics. Now, the problem from his perspective, or the problem from the Cynic perspective, was that conventional values, conventional ways of behaving, conventional rules religion, politics, all of those things ultimately cause human suffering. Society itself detracts you from the things that are really and truly valuable, such as your personal autonomy, your personal freedom, okay, your independence, and your happiness. So the goal for the cynics is to have autarky, meaning self rule or self sufficiency. This is what you want. You want to be a self sufficient, independent being free and able to pursue happiness the way nature determines, okay? The key realization of the cynics is that if you have no desires, then you actually lack nothing. So in a way, it might sound a little bit similar to Buddhism and the idea of putting away our desires because desires ultimately lead to suffering. So there's a way to avoid suffering by relieving yourself of desire. Now, the cynic life advocated kind of an asceticism. Right? If you're going to shun society to a degree and the conventions of society, that would include the pleasures of human living right, and the luxury that goes along with it. Avoiding these things, part of the ascetic lifestyle, um, frees you up to live according to nature. Right? It's a minimalistic way of living. Uh, the neat thing about animals, for the most part, is that they live according to nature. They take care of their needs. right? They don't really have... Desires. I mean, we can talk about desires, though sometimes the early philosophers distinguish between types of desires. Aristotle does the same thing between what's called a natural desire and um, <clears throat> an acquired desire, which would be the difference between needs and wants. Okay, so again, animals take care of all of their needs. 
They live minimally. If an animal needs to go to the bathroom, it just goes. If an animal needs is hungry, it it gets food, right? It doesn't worry about rules and regulations and morality and those types of things. There's no morality among animals, right? So the cynics ultimately adopt a life modeled on the life of an animal. If they needed to go to the bathroom and they were in public place, then they would just go to the bathroom right there. If they had sexual urges that they needed to be relieved, they would relieve those urges, however, you know, easiest to do that right there in the public. No need to be shameful, right? No need, because shame is, again, the cultural thing. This is worrying about how people view you, right? You don't think about that. The dog doesn't think about that, which is why it's appropriate to refer to the cynics as dogs. Now, the term may have arisen through kind of a, a derogatory reference to the, to the cynics may have actually had to do with the place the cynics originally met, met under um, Antisthenes, but it really is appropriate as a model for the cynic lifestyle, right? They reject convention, they reject culture, they don't participate in government, politics, religion, or physical pleasure, okay? That's kind of the lifestyle of the cynic. It tends to be a little bit pessimistic and critical uh, in its attitude towards society, as you would imagine. And because of the lifestyle, I think, is one of the reasons it never becomes one of the most popular philosophical schools or approaches. Not that you can call it, you know, maybe a school in the sense of some of the others, but it's not going to be any, any ways the most popular of these groups. The most popular cynic, of course, was not Antisthenes. It was Diogenes of Sinope. And I shouldn't say, of course, because, you know, who? how do you know who's the most popular cynic until I tell you? But Diogenes of Sinope is the most famous of the cynics. His dates take him to really the same year as the death of Alexander. Apparently, um, in the, according to the legends about Diogenes, he met Alexander. Uh, but they die in the same year, according to tradition as well. And here are some images of Diogenes in his barrel. Um, some are statues, some are paintings. These are from much later. But the story is that Diogenes, being true to the cynic lifestyle, lived in a barrel or a bathtub, uh, no home. Uh, he walked around carrying a lantern as he was looking for a virtuous man. And in these illustrations, very often you're going to see a dog near him, again, a reference to the cynics. And it was a simple lifestyle. The story of his meeting with Alexander the Great is kind of interesting because Alexander supposedly comes to uh, meet with Diogenes, who is just relaxing in the sun on one nice day out in the countryside. And Alexander comes up to him and steps between him and the sun and issues him the um, offer or offers him. This is kind of like a cliche folktale type of offering, you know, ask whatever you will of me and I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom. Kind of those rash, you know, uh, offers that are made by powerful men. And Diogenes kind of opens an eye and looks up at Alexander and says, I would like you simply to get out of my sunlight. Um, he just wants to be left alone. Uh, and that's, again, consistent with the whole idea of cynicism. It's an illustration. I don't think it was a true story. I think it's an, a, kind of an apocryphal tale, but... It definitely illustrates the idea that he is a man who doesn't have desires. He doesn't have a desire for half of the kingdom or power or wealth or anything that Alexander could ever give him. He just wants to be left alone and enjoy life in harmony with nature. And Alexander apparently uh, said that if I were not Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes, apparently respecting this man so well, but definitely not willing to go to the extent of actually adopting the lifestyle. All right, the next group we're going to talk about are the, the skeptics. And this is actually not a single group. This is actually a number of different schools that are classified under the term skeptic. And just like cynic, and I mentioned this a second ago, is still a word that we have today. Uh, so is the word skeptic. If somebody is referred to today as a skeptic, we assume there's somebody that is very suspicious or doubtful of certain things. And it comes from the Greek verb, verb skeptomai, which means to search or to think about. All right, we understand it as doubting. And it's the idea that you have to question everything, and ultimately, we can't rely on the senses. This is not unusual. Plato says the same thing. Parmenides definitely said the same thing. The skeptics generally are in line. Now, the, the schools that can be grouped as skeptical are going to be these. The second academy, here you see the academy. This is going to be a school that is a successor of Plato's academy really a phase of Plato's Academy, rather. The second, sophistic. The cynics, they are also skeptical. Okay, it's a, its own school. The Pyrrhonists, which we'll talk about in a second. And the Stoics themselves could be skeptical in certain respects, though they're going to be a little bit more open to 
the possibility of knowledge. But the two main schools, I want to talk about the Second Academy, or the Hellenistic Platonists, and then Pyrrhonism. Okay, first let's start with the Second Academy, or academic skepticism. Now the head of the Second Academy, I've got two guys, Arcesilaus and Carneades. Um, remember when Plato died, he left the academy to his nephew Spusippus. Um, it wasn't until you get to Arcesilaus that you have, and this again is in the Hellenistic period, around 315 to 240 is when he lived, you have a new leader of that academy in Athens push a new worldview of sorts, right? A skeptical worldview, which I uh, come to the conclusion for the most part that knowledge is not possible, right? We cannot know. The possibility of knowledge is actually beyond us. And some extreme claims might be things like nothing can be known, not even this. That would be the type of statement you would expect out of an academic skeptic. Now, of course, that type of statement seems a little bit, not just a little bit, it seems rather self-contradictory. But this just is to illustrate the extreme nature of this type of skepticism, the idea that ideas themselves can never be true. And this actually follows from Plato's own epistemology. Plato's teaching, in a way, sets up this self-defeating skeptical phase of his school. Now, if you remember, Plato says that from the world of senses, the world that we're part of, the world of the receptacle, the um, sensible realm, we can never have knowledge, right? We only have opinion. The only way you could have knowledge is when the intellect or the soul grasps the ideas or forms that are in this other realm. Now, if you take Aristotle's idea of what truth is, right, which is a correspondence between one thing and another, it would make sense that ideas can't be true in the Platonic sense because ideas don't correspond to anything. Ideas are primary up in that other realm, right? The only things we have down here are just reflections of those ideas. So you can't really talk about ideas. You can talk about them being real, but you can't talk about them being true. The thing that really leads to, I think, the extreme skepticism would be when we think about Plato's epistemology, and I talked about the idea that you not only are born with knowledge, right? The soul has all the ideas within it, and you know everything. The idea that if you know any one thing, remember, you have to also know everything that it's not. So if our statement is something like, if I know anything at all, I must know everything, which would be consistent with Plato's epistemology, then you can imagine the students of Plato later on are going to realize, in a sense, well, I don't know everything, which means I must not know anything. Okay, so you move from you know some some type of omnipotence with with Plato to an absolute skepticism with his successors, um, which is really interesting. Um, again, mere probability of belief is all we have. All right, our opinions. Um, sensations, again, are relative. They're different from one person to another, and they never tell us about things. This is actually fairly uh, interesting because modern philosophy has moved in this direction at all, especially when you get to the moderns like Descartes and Locke and some of the guys down the road. But the idea that our, uh, our sensations don't tell us about the things out there, the, uh, the idea is that we're somehow cut off from the world that we seem to touch and interact with. The only things our sensations tell us about are the impressions things produce in us, right? The only things we're in direct contact with are those impressions. I may, you know, think I'm touching a tree, but the only thing I really know is my impression, my sensation of touching something. I don't know actually what's out there causing that sensation. So in a way, I've been cut off from the world about me. Um, you know, that, that, springs up for the first time, I think, with the academic skeptics, and maybe actually prior to that, maybe Parmenides has something similar, but um, that's good enough for the academic skeptics. I just want you to know what happened to Plato's Academy, uh, at least for a time, and how extreme it was. Pyrrhonism is going to be much more popular. Pyrrho of Elis is considered the founder of a way, in a way. The actual Pyrrhonist school is named for him a little bit later, but Pyrrho of Elis, 360 to 275, would have been the founder. And the problem for him was here we are wrestling with mental anguish, right? We pursue knowledge. We pursue truth. We pursue um, the, the idea of being right, right? Again, again, knowing something involves having truth. And it's very, very stressful and difficult to ever come to actual knowledge, 
right? Just learning a subject in school can be incredibly frustrating to um, try to fit different ideas into your worldview is a painful experience. And he realized that you could actually have, like the, the sophist earlier would present arguments on different sides of an issue, you could find persuasive arguments given on both sides of a view. And how do you determine then which view is correct? You have this whole idea of the problem, what's known as the problem of the criterion, where actually where is even the starting point for knowledge, right? Can it start with our sense impressions, right? Our opinions and sense impressions really can't distinguish truth from falsehood. My sense impression is different from your sense, sense impression. So where does knowledge actually begin if not in the senses? All right, so you could see that the idea of even coming to some kind of knowledge is a painful thing. And having opinions, of course, leads to desire, and ultimately we get to pain that results from this. So our goal is a psychological goal for this school. And I probably should have pointed out, I'm going to do this right now very quickly, um, kind of as an aside, the schools that we're looking at in this era are really focused on more practical pursuits than things like the systematic you know, metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and politics that are developed by Plato and Aristotle. These schools are systematic in a way, but they're more focusing on the individual life of the, of the, of the person, right? The um, morality and ethics becomes more a uh, central focus of these schools, right? So if you notice with the goals, you may have already gotten a sense of that. We're more concerned with our own happiness um, or lack of pain in this era than anything abstract. So the goal here is psychological. Again, they're interested in autarky, self-government, but I'll add another word in here, which is the word ataraxia. Ataraxia means mental peace or serenity, right? A lack of mental disturbance. So if you become skeptical, you could achieve ataraxia. Now, it involves going by what's called the middle position, an intermediate between true and false. Uh, that way they would refer to as the readily believable, the verisimilar, or the probable, right? The best we have is what's probable. Frustration can be avoided if we don't come to absolute dogmatic conclusions. We have to realize that it's ultimately useless to pursue intellectual things. We do seek truth, but we need to give up the possibility of actually finding that truth, Okay. And if you don't give up the possibility of finding, if you hold on to the possibility of finding it, then the, the struggle is always present and the pain with it. So epoche, which is a suspension of judgment, is kind of the goal of the, the Pyrrhonists. You're going to withhold consent regarding anything that's non-evident. Right? There are certain statements that are obviously true. Right? Those would be called self-evident propositions or statements. Okay. But if you have a non-evident proposition, something that you can't immediately tell is true, withhold your judgment, right? Arguments can be offered on both sides. If they can in any particular matter, then that's the type of belief or a type of uh, idea that we need to suspend our belief in regards to. And once we suspend that belief, we have reached a state of peace, okay? All right, the last group are the Stoics. The Stoic uh, school is founded by Zeno of Kidium. It's actually founded in Athens. His date's 334 to 262. He's definitely influenced by Socrates and supposedly a cynic by the name of Crates. And around 302, he founds the school, basically holding class, um, teaching his disciples at a place known as the Stoa Poikile, or the Painted Stoa. And a Stoa is just a covered walkway. These um, surrounded the, the center of the city of Athens. So this was right down there in the Agora in the city of Athens where he met with his students. Um, the three aspects of Stoic philosophy are these. Logic, physics, and ethics. The three big branches. Um, ethics is the central one because, again, Stoicism is about, ultimately, happiness. Uh, physics has to do with philosophy of nature, but the physics is a precondition for ethics. The idea is if you don't have the proper view of reality, then it's going to be difficult to live your life the right way because your life needs to be lived in coordination with reality. Now, the goal is eudaimonia, fancy term. Uh, also, again, you could say this is the goal of almost all of these schools, 
especially the uh, school known as the Epicureans, which I've uh, skipped over. But eudaimonia means blessedness for the most part, or happiness, ultimate happiness. Now, what that looks like is going to vary from school to school, but they were concerned with autarky, self-government. They're concerned with peace of mind, serenity of ataraxia, but another term I'm going to throw in, and it's another A word, is the word apatheia. This is the term most commonly associated with the Stoics. And you can even see an English word that is derived from apatheia, which is the word apathy. It has some negative connotation today. Apathetic people don't have um, care, right? They don't, they don't have emotion. They're kind of dull all the time. And it goes back to this idea, apatheia means a ah, without patheia, passions. Okay, the idea of without passions has to do with the ultimate control of our emotions. All right, that's the goal of the Stoic lifestyle. So let's talk about this idea of what's called the logos. First of all, their physics. It's a materialistic system. The Stoics believed that the universe, the world, was basically material. And matter itself is a passive substance out of which everything is composed, but there is an active substance as well out there. This is still material, but it's logos, reason, or fate. All right, there's an aspect of reality that is active and moving matter in a certain way in a deterministic fashion. This is kind of this um, thing that pervades reality and uh, guides it in a less than free way, determinism. So stoicism is definitely going to be characterized by a deterministic worldview. The logos, we could say, for the Stoics was some type of supreme deity. It's an impersonal thing. Right? You don't want to think of it as a, as a, a god like Zeus, though sometimes they would use that word to refer to the divinity. But it's ultimately identified with nature. Okay, So the supreme deity is nature itself, and nature is a rational substance. The logos is a reasoning substance, and the author of law, meaning both the laws of nature and reality and the laws of morality. Right? So nature always works according to some kind of setup by the Logos. Remember, that word actually goes all the way back. We've seen it when we talked about Herac Heraclitus earlier, right? The idea that there's everything is in flux, but it changes and morphs according to certain patterns. So this idea of a Logos being behind reality has been there for quite some time already. Now, all men participate in the divine Logos, in the divine reasoning, because men are rational beings. And we can, for the Stoics at least, rely on our sense perception. We could trust our senses to a degree. It's through the use of our senses plus reason that we can come to uncover the law, the moral, and the natural. Our minds are able to judge our perceptions, right? Even if it's true that our perceptions differ from one person to another, our reason allows us to make judgments about those perceptions and distill some knowledge of reality. Knowledge is actually attainable for the Stoics um, according to our reason. So while they're, they're considered skeptical in certain instances, they are definitely not extreme skeptics by any stretch of the imagination. They believe in knowledge, okay, in different ways to get it, including the use of logic. Now, as far as apatheia goes, let's talk about the ultimate end. The ultimate end is happiness, eudaimonia. I already gave you the term. And it's attained via virtue, by virtue. It, and virtue is the excellence of character. There are certain traits that are part of our being um, that we develop, which we call virtues. They're perfections of character. Uh, I may have talked about those a little bit when we did Aristotle because Aristotle had a lot to say about virtue. He actually is the one who essentially introduces us to virtue ethics. And the Stoics are virtue ethicists as well. Okay. Now, for them, virtue was willing in accord with nature. Again, willing in agreement with the logos. And that itself was sufficient for happiness. In other words, if you're a virtuous person, then you are a happy person. And this will involve a freedom from the emotions, this idea of apatheia. Wisdom and freedom require living in harmony with the logos. You have to, number one, accept determinism. You have to realize that things are determined and there are things you can never avoid. Right? It's often in our struggle against fate that we become most frustrated. Right? We think things are out of our control, and that obviously frustrates us. All these schools are interested in our ability to govern ourselves, freedom. And they realize, well, things are deterministic. And if we can accept that, that's one step towards peace of mind. And the one thing we probably can control, if anything, is our response to that fate. 
That's where apatheia comes in. We can't control fate. We can't control destiny. What we can control is our reaction to these things. And I love the illustration that's often given of a dog, taking a cynic emblem there, a dog who's tied to the back of a cart who's hooked to a team of horses. Now, the horses are going to start going down the road. What happens to that dog? Obviously, the dog's going to be pulled along because the horses are a heck of a lot stronger than the dog. And the dog has a couple options. You know, he's on a, he's on a leash tied to the bumper. He could pull in the opposite direction, in which case he's going to be choked and he's going to be dragged along with the horses anyways in quite a bit of pain. Or he can go with the horses, cooperate, move in the direction of fate, and he can maybe go back and forth on that leash slightly. There's a little bit of freedom, but his attitude makes the difference between suffering and not suffering. That's us. We're determined Right? Fate is those horses dragging us down. We're the dog tied to the bumper of the cart. And our only option is to control our reaction and avoid pain that is more than we can bear. All right, The stoic sage or the wise man, this is the ideal for the stoic. You know, Very few people actually attain this level, but this is the per- per- person that is perfectly apathetic. Not, again, in the modern sense. This is the one who has their emotions in control. The emotions don't control them. They're able to follow their duty. They're able to possess virtue. They're able to have the reward that goes with it. And the core virtues are things like wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Not for the sake of happiness, but they themselves are happiness. They also had a conception of a worldwide brotherhood. You know, man bonded together through reason a very much optimistic worldview. One of the reasons this becomes, I think, one of the most popular schools, not only here, but into the Roman era. And I'll give you some of the big thinkers at the end. Some of the most important Stoic thinkers are uh, some of these guys. Besides, you know, Zeno, who founded the school, you've got Chrysippus, who was the third head of the school in Athens and is even credited with giving us the invention of propositional logic. If you ever study logic, he kind of advances logic beyond where Aristotle goes. Later in the Roman era, you've got Seneca, who was a playwright and an advisor to the emperor Nero, very important figure there, uh, important Stoic thinker. Epictetus, who's left us some uh, really important Stoic writings, he actually was a slave um, who lived for a while in Rome. And then Marcus Aurelius, on the very far end of the uh, spectrum, Epictetus, who was a slave initially, Marcus Aurelius, who is an emperor of Rome. Um, and we'll talk about Marcus Aurelius later this semester in politics, and I know one of the groups is doing a presentation on his meditations, but he wrote his Stoic philosophy in his own memoirs that are known as the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, emperor in the second century AD, and one of the great emperors of the Roman Empire. Okay, So those are kind of a quick, quick overview of the Hellenistic schools. There are others. There are plenty of philosophical schools from the ancient world that we could have investigated. I would have liked to have included the Epicureans, but I'm leaving that up to, you know, the get people that are in the class to do a presentation on that. So for now, again, the thing going on in the Hellenistic world, multicultural blending of ideas manifesting in various forms. The mystery cult that we saw last time, which addressed some of the concerns of the generation, idea of being able to have some sense of destiny, some sense of control over one's fate and better afterlife, perhaps, if you participate in initiation rituals. And then on the other hand, the philosophical schools, which don't go into kind of the religious pursuit of that same thing, but again, the same goal, self-sufficiency, self-government, a better life, happiness, uh, a sense of community, the things that are beginning to disappear in this growing Hellenistic culture. And that's the last lecture that I'm going to be doing on the Hellenistic era. With our next section, we're going to turn our attention to ancient Rome, particularly the Roman Republic.